Acts chapter 17, verse 1 says, Now, uh, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, alleging, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. But the, but the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, these have turned the world upside down. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. When they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. We have we studied Acts chapter 16 a few weeks ago where the Apostle Paul and the crew that he was with went into Philippi. And we remember that they had Lydia and the jailer and the slave girl and all that, that happened to them. And now they've taken their route into Thessalonica. And I want to look at this this morning. Now I do ask that you pray for me. Brother Sam said I was up late last night. So <laughs> he told me at lunch of a preacher who, was, who dreamed he was preaching and he woke up and he was. <laughs> So I'll make a deal. If I fall asleep, y'all wake me up. And if you, you fall asleep, I'll wake you up. <laughs> I'll throw a book at you. <laughs> so here they are. They've passed now. Um, they're going west. They've gone to Philippi. Then they pass through two smaller cities. Then they come into Thessalonica, which was at this time a free Roman city. It was a Roman city, but it was, there wasn't a guard on every street. Uh, people were pretty free to do what they wanted to. Um, much like America today, I mean, there was more freedom here than you might find in other cities that were under Roman occupation. It met at two major uh, roadways or thoroughfares that met at Thessalonica, so it was a wealthy city. Um, it was multicultural from what you can read about it. There were many different cultures, and there were Jews and Greeks and, and all sorts of people, and they were wealthy too. So that sounds a lot like America, doesn't it? Um, our, our population today is multicultural. We're wealthy. Uh, and we're, we're free to some extent. And here they are, they go um, into Thessalonica. And in verse 2 it says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. First thing I'd like to notice with you this morning is Paul had a manner. Did you notice that? It says, And Paul, as his manner was. Uh, a manner is a form or, or a method it's a way of executing something. So it would be, I believe, safe to say that Paul was methodical in the things he did, right? He had a system or a way that he went about doing things. Uh, he had an orderly system that he behaved in. And although he was completely led by the Spirit of God, because you remember in Acts uh, 16, he wanted to go into Asia. He wanted to go east, but the Spirit said, no, go west. And he followed the Spirit, but yet he still had a method or a system to his madness, Right? So what I want to say this morning is it's not okay to have a system in the way you do things. It's not, it's not a wrong thing to have um, a method. Uh, his method was to go to the religious people. It says his method was to go to the synagogue and reason with them out of the scriptures. He used that same method when he went to Philippi. He goes down to the river where there was a prayer meeting wanting to be had. He went to the people, right? That's what you want to do with the Word of God is go to the people of God and get the Word of God to them, right? That should be the method of any God-called minister. And so although he was led by the Spirit, we see that he had a method. You know, when Jesus passes Peter, I believe in Matthew chapter 4, he says, he sees he's fishing and he says, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men. 
And so Paul's just following this same thing. He's going to the pond that has the most fish, right? He went to Philippi, then he went to Thessalonica. He's taking the message to the people. You know, you've never seen a man say, well, I'm going to go fishing today. And he throws his boat out in the water, but never cast his line, right? He says, just let's wait till they jump up in the boat. <laughs> and a lot of times we may have that message that, well, if God wants to bring people in his church, he'll do it. And that is true. But God uses you to fish men, right? Amen. In your personal conversations, in your daily lives. So Paul had a method. Here's, here's something. We need to have a method. Discipleship requires discipline. It's part of the word, right? And you're talking to somebody who bucks against that system a lot of the times. I like to do what I want, when I want. I don't like to get up at the same time. I don't like to eat at the same time, eat the same things. Now, I'm married to somebody that keeps me grounded. <laughs> Thank the Lord, right? We need people who are disciplined. But ministers need to have a method. We all need to have a method to the things we do. You talked about Benjamin Franklin earlier today, and you quoted him. He had a quote that said, If you plan to fail, you are, or if you plan to fail, you are planning to fail. Do you get that? If you, excuse me, if you fail to plan, that makes sense. If you fail to plan, if you fail to have a plan, you are just planning to fail. <laughs> and Brother Mark said, and you will succeed. <laughs> Somebody said, I'd rather aim at the stars and miss than aim at nothing and make it, right? <laughs> you need to aim for things. You need to have discipline in your life. You need to have a plan in your life. It's good to have a good Bible study plan, isn't it? If you just wake up in the morning and say, well, I'll read when I'm going to read. If you don't have a time to read your Bible. And I'm not saying this has to be rigid, and, and I am not one. Now, there are dictators in the church. Not, maybe not in, in our church, I don't think. But in churches, there are dictators that this is the way it has to be done. Everybody's different, right? Everybody can have their different method, but we need to have a method. So I'm not going to say you have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and read your Bible for three or four hours. Uh, maybe you want to read at night. Maybe you want to read in the morning. Maybe you want to read at lunch. As long as you're reading, that's what Brother Mark does. That. We might just get Brother Mark up here too. <laughs> we have a lot of fun at Bible study. We just talk, don't we? So It's okay to have some interaction. I love that. But you need to have a method, a time that you do it, right? A time that you... Because if you don't schedule in your day some time with God, you'll find something else to take that time, right? If you have a meeting at work, I've got two meetings tomorrow. I know when they're going to be. You know why? I scheduled them. I got one at 3 o'clock and I got one at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Only two meetings. That's pretty good for a Monday, isn't it? And, and every, all the corporate people said amen. <laughs> But you know how I know that? I scheduled it. So I don't know. I'll probably read my Bible when I get to work. That's usually just for me. That works. Um, and then I'll read it some at lunch. That's when I get a lot of my Bible reading done. Unless somebody offers to take me somewhere to lunch. <laughs> and then I read it later. But you see what I'm saying? You have a method to when you're going to do it. If you don't schedule time with God, then the devil will see fit that somebody else schedules something for you. So make some space for God. And you don't just open your, your Bible and, you know, it's good to have a Bible reading plan, whether that's uh, you're going to read the Bible through in a year. Uh, that's a good goal if you can do it. Um, but at least you're reading something, right? Don't just flip the Bible open and sporadically read. I don't think that's the best way to do it. Have a method to it. If you're just going to take a book and read it, and read a chapter a day through a book until you get done, do that. And we need to have a method when we're reading it. And, you know, I wrote down four things that your method should include. I'll tell you this. It should include prayer <laughs> and reading. If you're going to study your Bible, you need to read it, right? And then study. Uh, you need to, to look, not just to read it, but to read it and, and meditate on it. And say, what does this word mean? And maybe look up that word in a dictionary or in a concordance, right? And see what that word looks at. But most of all, you need to rely on the Holy Spirit to open up those words to you. This is a book that we can read and talk to the author at the same time. Amen. Right? That's a, that's a great blessing. But we need to do it. If we don't have a method to read it, um, you know, the, this is the food for God's people. And if you're not eating it, you're, you're, you're going to be spiritually sick, right? You're going to be spiritually sick unless you're consuming the food that God has placed 
I think it's good for preachers to have a method to their sermons, right? <laughs> if you just get up here, if I just got up here today, I mean, I studied Acts 16 this week <clears throat> to a certain extent. I'm not saying how many hours, I didn't put in hours and hours over it, but, um, you know, you don't want to just open the Bible. I've heard some, some say that we just need a, uh, I, mean, I heard a preacher one time say, we just need a pulpit Bible. You can't even take your own Bible up there and just open it and you start preaching. <laughs> you know, no notes. No study. I'm going to tell you, that's done a lot of harm to God's churches when people don't study the Word of God, when ministers don't study the Word of God. That'd be like saying, you know, I want to go to O'Charlie's, but I don't care how they cook it, <laughs> right? I don't want somebody that's trained how to cook it. Just get back there and cook the chicken. You wouldn't want that chicken, would you? You want somebody that's trained and that is, that is studying the Word of God. And some kind of maybe an outline. And that doesn't have to be something written down. You know, sometimes people say, well, do, can, you, can preachers use notes or can preachers not use notes? One thing I've learned is most, most, all preachers use notes. Some of them may be mental notes. <laughs> Some of them may be notes in their Bible. I personally use, I, I write down definitions and things on an iPad. I, I was worried about that because some, some people are against using notes in the pulpit. I called Brother Harold Hunt and asked him one day, Brother Harold's full of wisdom. And I said, what do you think about using notes, Brother Harold? And he doesn't even really know me that well but we've had some great conversations on the phone I said what do you think about using notes and he said brother Josh a small pencil will go a lot further than a large brain <laughs> so use notes if you want to preach right if, if I'm going to give a presentation I'm going to use notes there's a lot of things I would forget if I didn't write them down I've, I've read from, from Brother Michael Goins wrote an article about it, and, and he gave the advice to keep something where you can write down what you're thinking at all times, because you may be driving down the road. Some of the best sermons I've ever had were driving down the road and just came to me. And you better have somewhere to write them down, because if you think, I'll remember it when I get home. Just three days ago, Carrie said, Josh, will you go get Bo a diaper upstairs? <clears throat> and I said, sure. And I walked upstairs. <clears throat> and I walked back downstairs, and I didn't have a diaper. You understand? I forgot just walking up five or six stairs. So if I get a sermon in my mind or an outline in my mind, I better write it down or I'll forget it. Amen. So that's just good preaching advice, I guess. And so it is good to be organized, but it is also good to know that you rely on the Holy Spirit of God, right? We don't want to become dry lectures up here. Um, to the people of God. We don't want to that we want to rely on the Spirit of God. And just because we don't have a formal organization. You know, I love that we are an independent church. They say, what is a primitive Baptist church? It's an independent church, right? It's a part of the primitive Baptist. There are primitive Baptist churches throughout America, primitive Baptist churches in Africa. But we don't have a headquarters where we meet each year to talk about what are going to be the pressing issues for the year among the denomination, right? We, re we report to one person, and that's our head, Jesus Christ. But it's still okay to have a little organization, right? If you didn't, if you didn't meet to say, how much food are we going to need for the meeting? You might have too much. You might have too little. <laughs> right? There's some good organization that can be done. You need people that help organize the meetings, right? Where are people going to stay? Do you get what I'm saying today? We need organization. And we need leaders to step up and do that, Right? Do you agree with me? We need people that are willing to step up and lead in those efforts. And I think we do a great job here. But God's not against, this is my point, God's not against organization. He took 40 men that wrote 66 books and put it into one book for us all to read. He's not against organization, is he? No. So Paul had a method to his madness. I may have belabored that point a little bit, but forgive me. It says, and Paul, as his manner was, went into them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. The thing I want to point out here is Paul went into them and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He conversed with them. He discoursed. He, he had a discourse uh, with them. Uh, one, of the, one of the definitions for this is to argue, but I don't think Paul went in there guns a-blazing <laughs> to these people. He sat down and had conversations with them in the synagogue, right? Um, one of the best things you can do when discussing scripture with your friends, your family, your spouse, whatever it may be, is do not lose your cool. 
when you're talking to him, right? Y'all remember that guy that we were discussing at work? I told y'all the story. And he got really mad and started cussing at me. <laughs> and the next day he said, I'm sorry, I only cuss when I discuss politics and religion. <laughs> Now, what kind of witness, in all seriousness, do you have to people? How many marriages has, 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 has the devil been able to drive a wedge in the marriage because they, they argued about the things of God, right? Do you think about that? How many friendships have been ruined because people argued about the things of God? They didn't come in meek and mild and lowly in spirit and discuss what we have to know. Do you understand what I'm saying today? We used to debate as primitive Baptists all the time. I mean, not all the time, but I've got some of them back in the day, and they're pretty interesting to read. But do you know that Paul lists debate as a work of the flesh in Romans chapter 3? Amen. You ever watch Hannity or somebody at night, and they'll have 15 people on there, and they're all just yelling at one time at each other? What good does that do? <laughs> My wife will say, cut it off. And I'll say, be quiet, I'm trying to listen. <laughs> But what good is it to debate one another? It wouldn't do me any good to debate somebody. Don't lose your cool. A, a, a key hallmark of Christianity is a word called temperance, and that means self-control, right? In Galatians, it lists the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 23, or five and ver, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 23 says the fruit of the Spirit lists some of them, meekness and temperance. That's the last one listed. Against such there is no law. Listen to 2 Peter Chapter 1, starting in verse 5, says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness <coughs> charity. Paul wrote to Titus in Titus chapter 2 and said that he was to teach things that become sound doctrine, and one of those is the aged men be temperate, that they be self-controlled. self you can't really be a disciple of Jesus Christ without some self-control. And it takes reliance on the Spirit of God to have that self-control, right? Amen. Wednesday night, I was trying to teach Bible study here. and I won't call any names, but someone suggested that we raise our hand before we talk. You remember that, Brother Sam? <laughs> and I won't call any names, but some people didn't raise their hand when they wanted to talk. To me, you need to work on your temperance if you can't raise. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't just Brother Sam. We all need to work on our temperance, right? I went to a tailgate yesterday. They had full moon barbecue. I should have worked on my temperance. <laughs> I needed a little more self-control after that fourth plate, but it was good. So raise your hands if you have a question. <laughs> Listen to Proverbs chapter 18. We're talking about going in and reasoning with people out of the Scriptures. And when you're, starting to, when you're talking to people about Scripture, uh, you're talking to people about something that's it's bigger than football. It's bigger than basketball. It's bigger than politics. And, 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 there, um, and there are emotions in these things. So if you're talking to someone who was raised uh, in a different denomination than you were, and you start talking about things that are different to them, uh, there are going to be guards that come up in their lives, right? There are going to be things that come up, and you can easily offend somebody by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time or in the wrong way, Amen. right? And Proverbs chapter 18 and 19 says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And what's that saying? If you offend a brother or sister, and you can take this outside the church, you, a friend, uh, you, you, you offend a friend, you offend a family member, you offend a co-worker, then it's going to be harder for you to get back in there and win them back than it is to take a strong city by force with an army. So we need to be gentle people, temperate people when we talk to others. But our method should be that we do it, right? And so he says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them three Sabbath days and reasoned with them out of the Scripture. Last point I'll make here is Paul reasoned with them out of the scripture. He didn't reason with them out of this is what my granddaddy always said or my uncle always said or this is what I think my church believes. He actually opened to them scripture. So you can say, well, this is what I've heard before. You know, somebody says, well, Jesus loves all the little children. And you go, no, 
Romans chapter 9 says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. I heard that at church. But you can't really defend Romans chapter 9. Probably not a good idea, right? Y'all agree with that? <laughs> you need to be meek. You need to be mild to these to people. But you need to be able to back up the scriptures. Peter would say, be ready always to give an answer to the hope that's within you. With meekness and fear. Y'all see what I'm saying here? We're meek people. I heard Brother Ricky Harker one time say the best thing to do is not to knock them between the eyes with a dose of predestination when you get an open door. But on the other hand, don't shy away from predestination. <laughs> don't shy away from the sovereignty of God in salvation. Don't shy away from the things you believe, but open to them the scriptures and show it to people in the scripture. If you start talking about predestination and foreknowledge and the effectual call and somebody says, well, I don't believe that. Open Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 and 30 and say, would you please read that and tell me what it means? Okay, you can do that in a nice way. But then you've opened to them the scriptures, right? Not your personal opinion. And personal opinion does not matter in the house of God. So he opened to them the scriptures. The scriptures are our means of true conversion to anyone. You know, I could say, I could go in and reason with my friends and say, well, we have family integrated worship and we sing beautiful hymns and we have great food and all that is true. And all that is good to tell people about your church. But if you're selling an experience, which is what most churches in 2017 are selling, if you watch their ads on Facebook or if you see what their literature says, is this an experience and what's in it for you and what you and your family can experience or what your children can experience with their youth group. And if we get into that as primitive Baptists and say this is what you'll experience, a simple worship service, that's, and all that's fine and good to talk about. But if you don't get down to the meat of what we believe in the scriptures, you're not going to keep them because they'll just go find a different experience a few years later. You understand that? The meat... Uh, it, it, what keeps the fish on the hook is the scripture, right? <laughs> uh, not, not some tacky bait of experience. And maybe that's mean. but The church isn't about your experience. <laughs> the church isn't a place you come to be entertained. The church is a place you come to entertain God. It's a place where you come to worship God. Do we agree with that this afternoon? That's what the church is for. To Him be glory in the church, not to man. He says in verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So what we, we have a glimpse into what Paul was doing. Uh, what did he teach them from the scriptures? It says he opened to them the scriptures. What did he teach? He taught the need for Christ. Right? He didn't, he didn't go in there and teach a, a self-help lesson on how to love your neighbor or how to love your spouse he showed the need for Christ and that is the building block that people need is their need for Christ right nobody's going to care how to love their wife or care how to love their spouse or care what you do with your money until they see their need for Christ and so Paul shows them here their need for Christ and may I say this we can't show someone we can show them out of the scripture their need for Christ but until they've been touched by the spirit you understand what I'm saying? Until they've been touched by the Spirit, they don't even know they have a need for Christ. Do you agree with that? But he shows them their need for Christ. This is opening a legend that Christ must needs have suffered. He was talking about sin and what sin demanded, and that was the cross. And that's not a popular message in 2017, but it still is relevant today as it's ever been, that sin demanded the cross. And that Jesus came to pay the sin that was demanded. Do you get that? That's the message of the church. That's the message that will change the world. Why did he need to suffer? That he must need suffer. And then he says, and risen again from the dead. Why did Paul want to show that he must be risen again from the dead? To show that he was a success. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, the, the need that we had to pay for sin would not have been met. Amen? So he says here that he opens and alleges unto them that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And then he preaches to them that that Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. Well, look at this. This is our job as children of God. Me as a minister of God and all of us. Our job really is just to open and allege or to lay out what we believe to people, right? The, the Apostle Paul 
told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, to make full proof of his ministry. And even if you're not an evangelist, which, was, which is one of the gifts that is listed in Ephesians chapter 4 to the church, uh, we should be doing the work of an evangelist, mainly to ministers. Ministers should be doing the work of an evangelist, right? It should be our method to go find people where they are. And for all its faults, you know, we talk about the Internet, for all its faults, it has opened up a door where we can reach people with the gospel, right? And so I hope the church isn't the last place to figure out that there's people on the Internet that need the gospel. There's people in Birmingham that need the gospel, uh, when, when the people were scattered in, is it Acts chapter 8? When the men and women were scattered. This is men and women that were scattered. And it says, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel of God. So even if you're not called by God to preach the gospel in his church, there is a call on your life to preach the gospel to your friends, your neighbors, and your relatives. And to open and allege. That is our job, to open and allege. And even though it is our job to open and allege the scriptures to our friends and family, we are once again so, so, so dependent on the Holy Spirit of God. So dependent. When, when Paul went to the prayer meeting in Acts chapter 16, he has success with Lydia when he opens and alleges the scriptures to her. But it says, because that's God had opened her heart. Do you remember that? At the very end of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the disciples are talking to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that Jesus himself opened their understanding. And that's what we should be praying for, right? Amen. That God would open hearts and open understanding to this message of grace that we have to open and allege to others. And what happens when he does this? In verse 4 it says, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So these are the God-fearing or worshiping Greeks. There was a great multitude of people uh, who consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the chief women, or the influential women, there was not a few. So we see that he's doing the work of an evangelist and he's having success. Verse 5 says, But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took upon them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them unto the people. We talked in Acts about it, and we were looking at Acts 16. You remember I said one of the, one of the method, methods the devil uses to get people is a mob. Well, here we see again that they're having success with these people in Thessalonica. And what does he do? The devil stirs up a mob with these unbelieving Jews. And it says here, he set all the city on an uproar. I think one of the things that Satan uses, and we see this today, even in America, is he loves to outrage people to get their minds distracted from the things of God. Do you agree with that? What is the media? Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, what's their job? To keep people outraged about something. It's Beauty and the Beast. We'll get people outraged about what happens in Beauty and the Beast, what Target doesn't do, whether or not someone kneels for the national anthem or not. And all these things, I'm against what was in Beauty and the Beast. I'm against what Target did with their bathrooms, and I think you ought to stand for the national anthem. But how many people are in a continual state of outrage over these things that the media is feeding them. And what is Satan doing? Distracting us from the things of God. What's the next thing I can watch about? I mean, if people don't stand for the flag, most of these people probably couldn't sing the national anthem. Why do we care whether or not they'll stand for it? I do wish somebody'd fire them one day. I mean, that would be nice. But don't get distracted by these things. It's Satan's. It's the flashing light over here. Look over here so I can get you off of the Word of God over here. And it's all of Satan. And he's been doing it since the beginning of the world. And he says they were moved. They were whole in an uproar. The last thing about verse 5 is 
unbelievers and believers are always going to be at odds with one another, right? Because the thing that a believer bases his life on is the thing that an unbeliever hates, right? A believer and an unbeliever, this is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? So we should not be surprised today uh, in America when the unbelievers don't like the believers, right? Because it's been like that since the beginning of time. And that's good dating advice. If any of you are thinking about dating, find you a believer if you're a believer and save yourself a lot of heartache. If you're looking for a spouse, don't find a fixer-upper. Find somebody that's got it together, right? You're not chipping Joanne Gaines. You're looking for a spouse for the rest of your life. Right? Find you somebody that's got it together. <laughs> somebody that can keep a job. That was good advice. Well, I just thought of that. Verse 6 says, When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world, uh, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. You know, we have lived in a time of great, Brother Derek was talking about liberty today. In America, we have lived in an unprecedented time of great religious liberty that the rest of the world has not known, nor may know after America's gone. And if Jesus uh, prevents his coming back uh, too much longer, you know, America won't be here one day. <laughs> All the, the nations have risen. and We might be here, but we may not be the superpower forever, right? And we may not have a religious liberty like we have today, and we still have religious liberty, uh, believe it or not, today. Now, we see a cloud approaching of people who would like to take that away from us, but that has not been the case in most, uh, most of human history. It has not been the norm. Uh, Paul told Titus that if you live a godly life, expect to be persecuted. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16 and verse 33, these things I've spoken unto you, that you might have peace, because in this world... You shall have tribulation. Brother Sam said one time that sometimes he feels like he got a free pass because he never served in the military, and I feel that way too. And sometimes in the ministry of God, I feel like I'm getting a free pass because I don't have to worry about somebody taking me away from my family or burning me at the stake. I feel like I'm getting a free pass. We should make the most of what we have, right? So many people, so many ministers, so many churches have done more with less than what we do today. We need to do more with the advantages that we have and the freedoms that we have. And they, they pull away Jason. And listen to what it says about the Apostle Paul and his bunch. He says, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. What a testimony to the life of the Apostle Paul and his disciples, right? I mentioned at my ordination that when, when Peter was preaching about Jesus, he said, uh, he said, who went about doing good, and that would be a great, that'd be a great carving on your tombstone, right? That'd be another good one right on the back side that says, he turned the world upside down. <laughs> Not just turn your plate upside down, Brother Sam, but he turned the world upside down. <laughs> he turned the world upside down. That encourages me to read things like that, that these apostles went into these cities that were given to idolatry and turned the world up. That gives you hope for Birmingham, Alabama, does it not? Amen. And notice what they turned the world upside down with was the gospel, right? Amen. The gospel. <laughs> they didn't turn it around with their programs. They didn't turn it around with the good works that they were even doing in the community. They turned it around by alleging that Jesus Christ should have died and raised again from the dead, the gospel. That's the only thing that's going to turn the world upside down. Do you agree with that today? That's the thing. That's the method of turning the world upside down. And I do not believe that in Birmingham, Alabama, we're going to come to this great big revival where the whole town, the whole city will turn to God. But I do believe there are individual people in Birmingham, Alabama, that you can turn their world upside down Amen. with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you turn one person's world upside down, that's, you're doing a lot, right? So don't be afraid. Rock their world. <laughs> I'll tell you, nothing will change your world or turn your individual world upside down like the gospel of the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
It's freedom. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Nothing other than the truth will set you free. You may have certain degrees of freedom in what you believe, but until you know that Jesus Christ paid the debt at Calvary and that it was paid for you in full and that the, the Holy Spirit came into you, not because of your acceptance, your baptism, your conversion, whatever it is, that he came into you because you were a son. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Once you realize that salvation is all of God and none of you, that's a freeing message. And it should liberate you to do the most you can to liberate others with that message, right? If we've been given the message, we should want to give it to others. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what they preach. Let us pray for opportunities for others to tell this to others. Then it says, whom Jason, this is verse 7, whom Jason, Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king one Jesus. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter who's in office, whether it's Obama or Trump or Robert Bentley or Kay Ivey or Luther Strange or Roy Moore. These are all kings of a temporary kingdom, but there is a king sitting on the throne today who rules and reigns in his kingdom and he is Jesus Christ the King of King and the Lord of the Lord. And sometimes we need to just remember that, right? Hey, go vote and vote your conscience and vote who you want to vote for. But never forget, most everybody I've ever voted for has lost. Are y'all like that? I mean, literally and truly, most everybody I've ever voted for, I've been voting for I don't know how many years now, most of them always lose. But don't get down because the King is still on his throne. <laughs> and when you're in tribulation, when you're facing persecution like they are, the king's still on his throne. He's still ruling and reigning. And one day he's coming back in fiery vengeance. He's going to take you to heaven. And he's going to pour out his wrath on the non-elect and the ones that trouble you in this world. So child of God, rest and just leave it in the hands of God. Right? Jesus Christ is still on the throne. Psalm 121 verse 1 and 2 says, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence my, cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. And I hope it's not like that clock Brother Sam mentioned that they had gotten so used to it that you've heard this. You really have help in heaven who can move heaven and earth for you. That's something to remember, right? That America is just a temporary kingdom. It's not the end all, be all. Verse 8 says, And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. Many of us today have probably become weak. And many of us today, because we've had it so good, if we, first, if we faced persecution... Many of us would probably run. I've heard that hard times make strong men and then that easy times make weak men. We've had it good, right? Yeah. The Apostle Paul faces all of this and then he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, For you yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. No matter what persecutions you face, whether, and really, what's the worst that's going to happen to us in America? People don't like us. People don't like what we say. People don't want to hear what we have to preach. No matter what you face, be bold about it. Because people aren't going to listen to you if you're not bold about what you believe. It's like Brother Hugh said, he asked the, he asked the waiter, you remember that Brother Hugh Sanders, how's the soup? Oh, it's awesome. Have you ever had it? No. <laughs> Would you want to buy soup from that guy? But if you're bold as a lion, I'm telling you that doors will open and we will find people who want to know the grace of God.
Do you believe that today? I do. There is hope for the church of Jesus Christ in the middle of a wicked and perverse nation. But the only way to reach them is through the boldness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your kind attention. Amen.